you have to be in this thing of of comparison of essentially getting ahead in order to be of worth and the problem is is that that attitude of getting ahead is, is it's getting ahead of what it's getting ahead of other people and so you get engaged in this game of some people are are have more worth than others mm -hmm. right it's kind of this underlying thing whether we're aware of it or not it's 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 running in that whole game of uh more right in that whole game of more 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 which is the game of get 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 and you might be have more than other people but that always means that there's people who have more than you and so you're constantly in this thing of evaluating your worth from this external place this is Way of the Artist with Brandon Colby Cook and Evan Schulte. Identifying your blocks and demystifying your struggles so that you can claim your own path and make your life a work of art. Well, everybody, it's that time. Once again, once again, doing that way of the artist podcast thing uh this one um you know we're 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 starting this one out on on an idea of this idea of creating from worth whether that's actually what the name of the podcast ends up being or not we're not sure but that's uh that's our starting point creating from worth so i think that um obviously this conversation is going to have something to do with this idea of worth this idea of uh self-worth and from there so I, I i'm i'm assuming i don't know for certain of course but i'm assuming that this conversation is going to demand some sort of a conversation just around that just around this idea of our worth our self-worth as as human beings and then I guess in essence, and what comes, what comes with that? What comes with perhaps some different understandings of what that means about what our worth is and what can we, what can we do perhaps from a different sense of our worth, a different sense of our self-worth? What can we create from that? Um, not simply as if we are, are artists, but what, what can we create, um, what can we create in our lives? So uh, I'm I'm really intrigued to see where this conversation goes, and uh, and and what we might find along the way with this one, and and if if it makes any kind of deviations from this uh, from this starting point, well, I'm sure it will. Uh, so Brandon, uh, what do you, how do you want to kick uh, kick things off with your opening statements? Well, I. In my opening statements, <laughs> I'm I'm intrigued to see where this is going to go as well. I you know I don't I don't know exactly, and I think for me that's actually kind of the point, because something and I think I'll just reiterate this because we talked about this just before we started recording, which is that when you set out on a journey, I think I think this is pretty common for most people. So I'm going to speak generally, not just personally, but I think what happens for most people is we set out on a journey because we want something, there's something we desire and we go, well, I, I want that. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to get it. And you start walking down the path of whatever that might be. And maybe whatever you were looking for, you already had, but you didn't know it. And so then you're kind of like, well, why would I continue on? Why would I keep already because basically you're coming from a place of lack you're coming from a place of i don't have this i'm gonna go out and get it and then you realize you had it and you might feel foolish you might be like well that was silly i wasted all this time trying to get this thing i already had i could have just acknowledged that i had it and started from there but you know i think one of the points that i want to bring up because this has been true for me to some degree is that i had to walk a certain amount of that journey to realize i had it it wasn't like I could I could do nothing and then just recognize that I had it. So, for example, uh, you know, self worth. 
maybe you didn't feel like you had a lot of value. You know, maybe you didn't feel like you were good enough or you had love or, you know, whatever it might be. I don't know. And so then you go, you set out to get it, right? And then you realize, well, wait a minute, like, I didn't need to go out to get that. And I think like something that's interesting to me about this whole this whole talk we're having is that when you realize that you already have worth, you have a new challenge because you're not setting out to get it anymore. Now you just have it to work with it. And so you might go, well, that's all I wanted. I just wanted to feel worthy. I just wanted to feel worthwhile or loved or good enough. And so then I don't know why I would do anything else. And this is, this is, I think an interesting conundrum we run into is like, well, maybe it's not about getting something now. Maybe it's about giving something now. And maybe also you're not going to direct yourself to the same destination you had set out to go because maybe that destination you were never meant to get to. Maybe that destination was only something you were supposed to set out to get to and you're actually supposed to end up somewhere else but you had to get on the journey and go down the path to even realize that you would go somewhere else because there's no way you could see that when you started out. And so I think there's this interesting thing for me about what we're talking about, which is that the course sometimes changes partway through and that's not a bad thing, but it can feel like a bad thing. It can feel like a waste of time and it can feel like you've messed up or you were confused or, you know, whatever that might be. So I, that's an interesting kind of angle I wanted to bring into this. I don't know if that's going to be the, the dominant point of the talk, but to me, there's something about creating from worth where you, you almost have to start, start the journey to become aware that you have the thing that you thought you were after, you know, since the beginning. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's often a, a theme of like, especially when you look at, you know, one of the oldest human traditions of, of storytelling and one that has a lot to do with, uh, with art, but that, that's, uh, that's a timeless, uh, type of story that we, we tell someone sets out on this journey to discover that they already had it, you know, like uh, the, <laughs> the wizard of Oz immediately comes to mind, right? It's like they set out on this whole thing to discover that they, they had, they had these things with them the whole time. Um, and and they just never realized it. They never really um, put themselves out there or had the perspective on themselves to to really understand that. Oh, you know, I I do have these things. I just like maybe it just shows up in a different way or or it appears. And so it's it's it's, it's a it's a very yeah it's a classic timeless human story that that we we kind of just love it, you know, like that there's this adventure that we have to set out to, to realize that the sort of the treasure was, is, is within. Um, so yeah. I, and I think that, uh, you bring in something that, uh, is, I, I think a major part of this conversation as well, which is this whole give, get, um, you know, this whole give, get dynamic that, that emerges from it, um, that emerges from worth, because I, I think that that's something that we see play out, uh, in the world a lot, uh, that I think th I may be being a little presumptive on this, but I think is something that most of us are probably more caught up in than, than we would probably care to admit than that we would probably be fairly embarrassed to admit that we are more caught up in this, in this type of thing than, than we would like. Um, which is, yeah, like when we are operating from a place where our focus is, is on what we're getting, you know, like, oh, I need to get this and I need to get that. And if I do this, I can get that. And if I do this, I can get that. That I think at its foundation comes from a place of trying to, to acquire that worth is really what it is because all of these things that you get are some will somehow be an affirmation to you that oh i am worthy because i'm i am getting these things so i am i am worthy and that 
if you if if we look at that it's pretty clear where that goes to that goes to an endless cycle of um tremendous insecurity and anxiety because it demands a continual pursuit of getting um and getting isn't always something that we have much control over in fact we we have very little control over what we get and in fact is one of the, the is is the arguably the biggest lesson of one of the great spiritual texts the bhagavad gita is the, the this whole idea of like no like you you is to learn how to take action in your life without any expectation of what you what you will get from it what the let go of of any idea of the fruits of your efforts just focus on your efforts um i think in part because there's there's for a long time been this recognition that that this that way of operating that standard operating procedure of of getting if you if that's where we're working from is that it creates just tremendous distress um because we don't have control over it because um so much of it depends on on things that we have no control over and so we live in a state of anxiety as a result of it and in the most so in in most people's lives i think it it shows up as that that just general anxiety most people you know today admit to living with some degree of anxiety in their lives and that's just kind of on, on like an average typical level on a very extreme level you see people doing all kinds of really horrible shit to other people because you have to just exert more influence you have to exert more power and and not just power but power over you have to have power over more things in order for you to control that getting in order for you to ensure that getting which is just is is a is a beast with a bottomless stomach mm. and um and so even as even as you get power and as one of our favorite philosophers alan watts uh in a wonderful talk i heard some years ago uh would d beautifully described how anybody who wants power hasn't really actually thought it through <laughs> because of this precise problem because the to have power means to to continually have to control more and more and more things so that you can stay in power and to control more and more things requires you to have um you know to have to have more people more more th more things uh more what's the word i'm looking for y you have to have more mechanisms <laughs> you have to have more mechanisms in place in order to con to not only sustain but to continue to grow it and it has to keep on growing and the more it grows the the less you can you can trust people because you eventually have to trust people anyhow i feel like i'm getting a little bit in the weeds now um <laughs> But yeah, this get give dynamic I think is tied quite quite closely to this thing of of worth because that getting is trying to get worth from without as opposed to a shift to having worth from within. And that changes fundamentally the actions that we take in the world and the actions that we that we choose to pursue in our life um because it's no longer about trying to feed this this monster but is about something that you can contribute hmm. right uh something that you can you can give that is um bigger than yourself right um 
I'm going to shut up now. <laughs> Brandon, <laughs> anything in there uh, spark something for you? There's lots of stuff. Well, okay, so give from, you know, to 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 go and get from without or get from within. You know, there's that, it reminds me of that saying, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. If you live by their affirmations, you'll die by their criticisms. You know, um, there is mm-hmm. this kind of thing that it can it can feel um attractive or uh seductive i think is maybe a better word for it whereas you go like oh it feels so good when they give me this affirmation and so then you you are vying for this affirmation all the time and in the seduction stage of it all you're not really thinking about the consequences of that which is the criticisms that are going to come and they will come and eventually uh, you'll you'll have to face that in some form or another. And if you put too much weight on those affirmations, the criticisms will be absolutely brutal. And I see this with people a lot where they can't take feedback. And um, one of the things that I, you know, I tried to base a lot of my uh, my teaching on was that um, I kind of give people an option. I say, listen, when we work together, I'm going to give you an option. You can have level one feedback all the way up to level 10 feedback. Now, if, if if we give you level one feedback, that's what we would tell a child. They draw a painting, they show it to their parents, and you say, good job, great. It's like a circle and a square. It's like garbage. But like the little kid tried. You know what I mean? And so you're like, what you're trying to do is you're giving them feedback uh, to encourage them. And that's all you're doing. You're just, I'm going to encourage you. I, I recognize that, you know, you haven't had the time to build the skill and the whatever and so all it is is just to try and encourage you to do more, to feel good about what you're doing so you have the confidence to keep doing it, right? So that's what level one is. Level 10 is what, what the real world is close to reality that we can give you. And it, one of the rules about level 10 feedback is that you never give criticism to harm or to tear down. You only give it to build up. And this takes a tremendous amount of trust. I mean, so there's a couple of things I want to just bring up about this. First of all, if you're going to give people what you want to call reality feedback, level 10 feedback, like professional high quality level feedback, if it's not coming from a place of love to build it up, it's not real feedback. It's actually bullshit. And um, that's your ego and that's your own arrogance, right? So if you're going to get level 10 feedback, first of all, you got to trust the source. And it's, you know, but level 10 feedback is you've trained, you've worked, you've perfected, you've designed. And level 10 is about finding the littlest detail that's like, hey, you know what? The edge is rough over here. Or, um, you know, this this is giving a feeling or a sense that whatever, and this is kind of, you know, or this isn't fully thought out or fully baked, right? Like it's not worked out. And this can be hard because you put a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of training and practice to get to this point and still not quite enough. And people who live by applause and they live by um, these types of validations from the outside, they can't take level 10. And they, they essentially, they plateau, which I would say is probably level six, level seven of feedback. They just can't take the real world feedback. It just hurts them too much because they, they basically want that level one feedback. Really. They want that encourage me, encourage me, encourage me feedback. And, um, you know, if you really want to transcend in your craft or anything that you want to be great at, you need to, you need to recognize that the people outside of you aren't giving you the worth. It's something that you have to find in yourself. So like, you know, I'm not saying that because like, you might have worth, but you might not have developed skill. So like, don't confuse worth for skill. Like you, you know, you haven't trained or practiced or figured it out, or you haven't gotten enough feedback to help you understand what you're doing wrong. So, so it doesn't mean that because you're doing it wrong or you're doing it, let's even say poorly, or, you know, not up to the standard that, you know, you're com- competition or whatever is doing it doesn't mean that you're not worthy or or full of worth it just means that maybe you don't understand how to express your worth yet 
And, you know, one of the things I think is when we're looking for our worth from the outside world, we're kind of doomed to never experience what our worth actually is because you're using the world to confirm that you're worth something. And at a certain point, the world will stop encouraging you. And that's where your own internal sense of worth needs to transcend encouragement. And if you don't have an internal sense of worth, you will essentially stop when the criticism becomes something where it's it's more critical and less encouraging. And so you'll just plateau and you, and you won't be able to go any further. And I think a lot of people get stuck in this stage. So to me, in a, lar in a large way, like what we're talking about here is creating from a sense of worth is going like, okay, I haven't got this all figured out yet, but I know I could. I know that if I keep working, if I keep trying, if I keep understanding, I can get there. And so if someone gives me critical or harsh feedback, I'm going to look at that and I'm going to, I'm going to use it to help me figure out how to get more of this worth that is already in me out because clearly I'm not getting enough of it out. And, you know, it could be like, uh, like one more thing, Evan, I just want to say like people who are encouraged all the time as as much as they can build confidence from that, they can also build arrogance. And there's a downside to constant encouragement with no criticism because these people can go into the world and think, oh, I've been encouraged. Everybody thinks I'm great. I'm so great. I'm so great. And then the, they get into the real world and the real world goes, no, this is shit. And they're like, but everyone else encouraged me, you know? And it's like, yeah, but maybe they weren't telling you the truth. You know, and so now you've actually underperformed at what you could do because you wanted the encouragement more than you wanted the excellence of what you could do. And, you know, so creating from a sense of worth, I think we have to build a certain internal world of like, look, I don't have the skill yet, but I can have the skill. And if, if the consequence is finding out where I don't have the skill to learn how to get the skill, then I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to put aside this feel good encouragement feeling and trust that I'm going to encourage myself. I don't need them to encourage me. They're going to tell me what I'm doing wrong. And I'm going to encourage myself to go do what needs to get done. And so I think this is kind of one of those things is like, you know, it's, it's a bit of the, the tough love, but it's like, at, at a certain point, you, you got to not give away all your power to everybody else to tell you you're good, you know, to tell you you're worthwhile. At some point you have to decide I'm, I'm worthwhile, but not from an arrogant place, from a place of like learning and, and, and like humble. Okay. You know what? Like, I know I have the worth inside of me, but yet I don't know how to do it yet. You know, I don't know how to express it yet, but I know it's inside of me. So somehow I have to figure out what I need to do to get it out of me in a way that is effective and it will actually land with people. And when people like there's that gap, you know, I guess from let's just say from level seven to level 10 of feedback, right? Where it's like still kind of encouraging, but it's a little bit critical to it's, it's, it's very critical, but it's critical from love, you know, to that, to like, or even sometimes critical, harsh, but it's like that, that stage, that's where the best performers in, in not just art, but in sport and in business, that's where they live. I, I, I am certain of it. They live in that reality of this, this reality between they encourage themselves, but they are willing to take the feedback to figure out how to up their game. They don't look at feedback in, in as a negative against them. They look at it as a way to improve and bring more out of themselves, which they know is already there. And where people fail is people give them criticism and they go, oh, I'm not getting that validation anymore. I must not have it. That's where most people, I think, live and fail at what they truly want in life. But it doesn't mean it's not there. It's just that they have a poor perception of their own worth, if mm. that makes sense. That's kind of my take on it. Yeah, I mean, feedback isn't. Uh, that's kind of an interesting thing to emerge as part in part of this conversation. I mean, for for me, it's. I think that that great feedback. 
uh, and criticism is actually always a form of encouragement um, when it's done well. Uh, I think that there there is an art to to effective feedback because the because criticism should never be to discourage somebody. Hundred percent agree. Right? Like yeah. you know, it's like like we, if we want to look at the opposite end of that of that thing, and and but I totally hear what you're saying. Like there's just there's a kind of encouragement which is yeah like that very sort of like just just trying to like lift somebody up not say anything negative and that's that's not particularly great um a great form of criticism or encouragement even for kids actually i was reading a a thing just sort of a side note um that in terms of of uh talking to kids and like things they've done, like, you know, they did like a drawing or a painting or something like that. Um, actually just saying like, good job is, is, is not, is not a, is yes, not a I, great, I know which one you're talking about. I know a, this a great study. tool. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you're supposed to actually encourage process. Um, so instead of just like, Hey, look at that. Good job. It's, um, you know, which is encouraging like, result, right? Yeah, not, not yeah. Process, Instead yeah. of process, like it's like, it's like, oh, um, you know, like, I, like that's a really interesting color that you chose to use there. Why did you do th- like, like, why did you choose to use that color? Like, in, like actually engaging in in sort of that that thing that isn't, you know, providing anything that that's giving anything that's negative to the kid, but is is still is building something else instead. But anyhow, as you get older, yeah, you you want to be receiving um and and be able to effectively receive uh criticism but again uh great criticism is always about encouragement never about discouragement uh because i think that really great criticism is always about um idealistically it's coming from a place of recognizing in the person that you're giving the criticism to a kind of light, you know, a kind of something that it's recognizing the thing that they're trying to give. Right. Right. Recognizing that they are, that they are trying to give the world something. They're trying to give us something positive. And, um, and helping that person potentially see a blind spot so that they can more effectively give that, that aspect of them, of themselves out there. So I think that, yeah, like good criticism is always encouragement. Um, even when it's pointing out things that, that, um, miss the mark, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, can I say something on that? Of course, like, of course. I, I, a hundred percent agree with you. I think everything you said is, is, is absolutely true. And that if we're going to give criticism, we should, we should look to give light as well as like error. Um, and, and that's, I think that's great advice for the person who is being critical and, and helpful in that respect. But if you're the receiver, I don't think you can always expect great criticism and so I think that yeah. one of the things I just wanted to mention was that we need to build a certain amount of strength to internal strength to be able to find the light when people aren't exactly giving that to us, because not everybody's going to give great criticism. Some people no. are just going to be critical, but it doesn't mean that them being critical isn't helpful, but they're not going to take the care and have the tact and all of that stuff. And, um, you know, discouragement is is brutal because when you get discouraged, you know, you, you essentially like, you know, you start to think like, well, what, what's the point? Like why even try? Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, as you, as you go through this world, um, I think, yeah, try to be somebody that inspires great criticism and try to build relationships and surround yourself with people who want to build great criticism and try to, communicate that to people. Like I think, uh, you know, something, uh, I would say that I've learned is, um, 
if you're going to ask somebody for feedback, be like, listen, I want to know both what's working and what isn't working. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it, like, give me a sense of what, what, what you're liking and what you're not liking or, and, and like, you know, and, 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 and you can kind of coach them into giving you a better feedback because, you know, I, there are people that I've talked to, you know, in, in the past where I've shown them something and nothing I ever show them is ever good enough. It's always like, well, that could be better. That could be better. That could be better. And, uh, you know, as we're having this conversation, I'm thinking about it, I'm going, you know, with those p people who are always trying to see like, well, what would make this better? What would make this better? Right. Which is great. You know, and maybe they have an eye for it. Maybe that's why I asked them, but to say to them, I'm also interested in what you, what you think is working. Mm -hmm. Like I'm trying to improve this and I'm looking for your advice on how to improve this, but give me context as well. Help me see what I'm actually doing right. Because I have gotten feedback from people where just, the way they communicate, it sounds like everything you're doing is wrong. <laughs> yeah. And then I show other people and this is amazing. Whoa. How did you do this? And you're just like, well, um, you know, it always also puts everything in. you're doing is right. Apparently. Yeah. And apparently. You know, there's something wrong with that too. <laughs> well, and you know, um, I'll share one other thing too, is like, you really need to consider where you're getting the feedback from because sometimes you're trying to impress somebody or something that isn't relevant. So what I mean is like, if you are an actor and you put up a play and then you ask like, I don't know, another actor, what did you think of it? And that actor might be like, well, you know, like it was good, but the technique here, da, 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 da. And that's great. You know, sure. But like, maybe you should ask an audience member who's not in the industry, like what they thought about it. Because something that I realized, like this was a long time ago, that the people I'm putting the play on or making the movie for are usually not in the industry. And they're not looking for technique. They're, th what they're looking for is how did it make me feel? Did I enjoy it? Did I laugh? Did I cry? Did I whatever? And you often find that your true audience gives you much, much better feedback in terms of how did it land? Because you could do everything technically right. And it gives people no real emotional experience. And you go, well, I did everything right. But it's like, yeah, but like, that's not the real audience. That's not the real purchaser of the service or the product or whatever. Right. I want to know about the person that actually wants to buy this thing, not the person who is trying to figure out how to do this thing, because they're not probably going to be the one buying it. You know, and it could be really with anything, um, you know, so I think, um, I think there's something to consider with this is like, if you're, if you're going out and you're creating something, you know, trying to be, just be mindful, who, who are you trying to impress? You know what I mean? With whatever the hell it is that you're trying to do. I mean, like, um, you know, are you trying to impress your colleagues or are you trying to actually provide a service or something for people that actually want your service or product? You know what I mean? And and that can be in the arts or whatever, right? Like, um, so I think we can get a little bit confused because like people who I find in the film industry can be quite critical of stuff in the film industry. But the majority of people that buy stuff and the reason why the film industry makes money is not from people who are in the film industry. It's from people who are not in the film industry. And so, yeah, like, I mean, a lot of people will say like in the film film world, they'll be like, oh, they won the Golden Globe or they won the Oscar or they won whatever. And I know a lot of people that are like, the Oscars are bullshit, Golden Globes suck. Like, these are the movies I like. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I know a lot of people and I feel like it's more and more people are like that more and more as time goes on because they don't care about the political agenda or the social movement that maybe those award shows are trying to reward and acknowledge. They care about the entertainment, the emotional feeling, the enjoyment they had at the theater or at home or on the date or whatever. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when you're thinking about whatever it is you're doing or creating, consider the fact that you know, you're not, you're not always trying to, you know, to get the approval of 
the people you think you're trying to get, you know? And, and I think this is a relevant thing because, um, you know, some people can say, well, like, I don't know, Adam, Sa I'm going to use an example, Adam Sandler, people, well, I'm Sam some, I've heard people say, Adam Sandler, like his movies suck, you know, blah, blah, blah. Adam Sandler is one of the most successful, prolific producer actors of our generation. Now, you can say what you want to say about Adam Sandler. You can say, you know, his movies are not this or that or whatever. But what they are is they're entertaining. They sell. They make money. Uh, he can. He has a very successful production company. And he enjoys what he does from as far as I understand. And continues to do it, so he must. So if he bases his journey on what, say, the critic thinks, you know, the film critic, the artiste, then, you know, maybe he doesn't have the career and the joy that he wants. And maybe that's not the point for him, right? Um, it doesn't mean that he hasn't done great work, um, but he's definitely figured out a business model for success in the film industry. And I think like, as you go through whatever you're doing, um, just kind of keep in mind that you can offer a lot of value. It doesn't, you don't have to be like, like, I know, Evan, let me just say one last thing. I know you love Daniel Day-Lewis. I, I love him too. I think he's amazing. But not everybody has to be Daniel Day-Lewis. You know, not everybody's competing with Daniel Day-Lewis. Like, if you put yeah. Daniel Day-Lewis and Adam Sandler together and you were to compare them as actors, you know, people would have opinions, yeah. right? But like, does that mean that somehow one is not worth something and the other is? Like, it doesn't, right? Like, it's context. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. This summer, Daniel Day Lewis <laughs> is Spider Man. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to see Daniel Day Lewis. Well, actually, in a way, I kind of do want to see Daniel Day Lewis as yeah, Spider Man. Yeah. But <laughs> um, no, I hear what you're. Uh, I hear what you're saying. Um, different and, services, different deliverables. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, and you know, it, it's funny because like things. I just recently listening to a, a pod and another podcast. I don't remember what it was but they were talking about how you know it used to be like um like critic reviews like for movies and stuff like that were really a, a, important they were right. really an, like they were and and now like they're actually not particularly important for how a movie does you know like movies do very well you know with poor critical reviews um, and you see that now because we have these platforms like Rotten Tomatoes and Metacritic and stuff like that. And you can see very often these stark divisions between what between what the critics thought and between what audiences thought. Right. And, you know, it's not perfect. You know, it's not perfect. But, you know, very often, yeah, like there's some terrific movies that the critics, you know, shit all over. But audiences are like, no, nah, there's something about this. This is really lovely because sometimes again yeah looking for different things um and other times it's reversed sometimes there's a really fantastic movie that the critics are saying like no please like watch this and for some reason you know you hear about uh movies getting like review bombed and stuff because there's some sort of agenda going on it's interesting how that can go both ways you know because yes. sometimes there's an agenda in the critical world and sometimes there's an agenda in the public world too um and and they can Anyhow, this is a whole side thing. I, I, I want, but it's, it's been a good, I, I, I've enjoyed this aspect of it, but I feel like we really need to talk about this whole thing about worth. We, I think, I feel like we haven't really addressed this thing of, of worth, self-worth. Um, and, and because I think it's such an important part of this conversation that I, I don't want to, um, I feel like we haven't really looked at this aspect of it, you know, directly enough. Um, so I don't want to lose that opportunity. So self-worth. Um, I mean, that's something that most people I'm sure have heard of your self-worth and self-worth is, a, as I understand it, is different than self-confidence, for example. They're completely different things. Um, Self-confidence in some ways is um, is something that you can develop. 
to a certain extent that you can work on. Um, but worth is, is something altogether different. Um, at least in, in my eyes and some people might agree or disagree. I think worth is something that you come, that you come with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and your worth is no more or no less than any other human being on the planet. Your worth is your worth. Um, and it says nothing about what you can or cannot do. Um, you are worthy as a human being for being here. You know, you are, you are, so it's one of those things that, um, it doesn't mean that, y that you don't have to put effort in or, or to put work in to, um, into the things in your life. It only says that it only says that you are no more or less, um, deserving than any other human being on the planet kind of a thing that's that's somewhat as i understand it but your worth um your worth is uh and and i hesitate to use this expression but it's i i can't think of something but like your worth is like that is like a god-given thing um mm. it's it's because you're here because you exist you are worthy in some way of of this existence um and there is um, an aspect of of a deep, deep love that I think is to be um, accepted. And I think that that is the, like the trick of this thing of, of self-worth, of our worth, is that it is something that we have to accept. Mm. It's maybe one of the greatest gifts that we can accept is our worth um, for the very same reasons as we began this conversation with and why I think it, it's such a tricky thing and why it's something that we have to, um, why it can feel like such a thing that we have to learn to accept is because we have been, uh, so conditioned to this attitude of thinking of getting we have to go and get our worth as opposed to no you have it mm. you have worth you don't get worth you have it um and that's a tough thing for us to do because it's like no 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 but you, you have to do things for it you have to earn it you have to you have to um be basically in this in this game of um one upmanship right you have to be in this thing of of comparison of essentially getting ahead in order to be of worth and the problem is is that that attitude of getting ahead is, is it's getting ahead of what it's getting ahead of other people and so you get engaged in this game of some people are are have more worth than others mm -hmm. right it's kind of this underlying thing whether we're aware of it or not it's 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 running in that whole game of uh more right in that whole game of more 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 which is the game of get 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 and you might be have more than other people, but that always means that there's people who have more than you. And so you're constantly in this thing of evaluating your worth from this external place. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to your worth, you came with it. Hey everybody, this is Evan, and this episode is brought to you by my book, 
Yes, I recently released a book called The Actor's Awakening, Connecting Spirituality to Craft. Expand yourself as an actor and your craft through a spiritual perspective. Take a journey that will explore universal philosophies and insights to help you understand human nature in a profound way and develop practices to take your work to another level. Again, that's The Actor's Awakening, Connecting Spirituality to Craft, available on Kindle and paperback on Amazon. And as always, if you like the show, please subscribe. I don't know where I was going with that necessarily, Brandon, as often is the case. But yeah, I don't know. What, what, does, what, what do you have to say to some of the things that I've just said? Well, uh, okay. Let's, let's, let's work this out, Evan. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the, you know, I, I'm, I guess I'm working through this on my own. So I'm, I, I want to be careful not to speak like some kind of authority on it. Cause, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if I know exactly, um, everything about this to me in a lot of ways, this conversation is a bit of a discovery. I think there's some things that I've maybe, I've maybe figured out and there's some things that I'm still working on figuring out, but from what I understand as, as we've been going through this talk and, and, and things that have led up to this talk, and I'm speaking about this in terms of the last several months and the last several years of just doing this podcast and doing this work we've been trying to do to, you know, investigate this stuff and on my own journey and whatnot, but it's like a self self worth is it's kind of like you like we, we all have it. Like you have it. I have it. We have it. Right. It's, it's, it's there. And you know, you can, I think what what the the challenge for a lot of us is is that we look at it in these terms of like potential, and we look at it in terms of um, comparison and results and things like that. And I think that's what confuses us around what what worth is. And I think that when we're looking at worth, like something that I, I mean, I've struggled with a lot in my life. Maybe this will give it context. But I truly saw love as very conditional for most of my life. And that probably has a lot to do with, you know, parenting and the way I grew up and just my my early perceptions of the world that, um, you know, in society and culture too and all of that. But it's like, I thought that I had to do these great things to be loved and that love was very conditional upon me developing and building myself into something and achieving something. And I think I'm sure there's a lot of people that can probably relate to this whole idea. And so those of us who have kind of bought into that idea, we spend a lot of our time pursuing things to try to validate why we should be lovable, why we should be chosen, why we should be accepted, you know, and all of this. And the problem with this whole idea is that it presumes the opposite. It presumes that you are not lovable, that you're not good enough, that you're not accepted, that you're, you're not all of these things that you're after, which is like, we we've been talking about kind of like the need to get and, and the desire to get and all of that. And well, you, you, you know, desire is largely to do with the belief that we don't have something. And I think what's very strange, difficult for particularly a lot of us in Western culture is like, you know, the whole idea of desirelessness is like very confusing to everybody. Everybody's like, what do you mean not to desire? Like, what, what, what the hell is that? Like, what am I going to sit on my butt the whole time and do nothing? How would, and... how would the world turn? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cause we, you know, our culture is very much driven on desire, right? Like it's like, I mean, economy is driven on desire, you know, all this stuff's delivered is, is driven on, upon these things. But like, if you recognize that you're worth, you're, you're, you're worth so much, whether you achieve great things or not, whether you become something or not, that that has no impact, like literally zero impact on your worth, then it changes the game and like you gotta understand too i think where people get where people struggle i think is that they go well yeah but they won't value me and it's like yeah but 
that's not the point. That's not what worth is. Don't you see you're falling into the same trap? You're trying to get their approval. You're trying to get their, their um, acknowledgement that you're worth something. And there are going to be people that are very stuck in lack and desire and, and, and the need to get, and they're going to look at other people and say, well, you know, this is worthless or this person's worthless or whatever, because they don't get them what they're trying to get. Right. Whereas, um, the problem with that whole mentality of like, I need this to get that. I need this person to give me this or whatever. You're only as good to that person as what you give them, which makes your relationship with them entirely conditional and entirely based on this almost tit for tat type of um, lack element, right? And you can see why the so many relationships, um, you know, marriages and things like that break down because when you when you're using people to somehow satisfy some selfish need, that eventually there's going to be a point where people are just not going to give you what you want. And someone can give you more of what you think you want. Right. And so then, you know, that's why you have a lot of these people who are like, you know, they lack fidelity and they, um, you know, betray and they cheat and they do these things because really it has nothing to do with their partner. It has to do with the fact that they don't have it in, they don't have a connection to it inside themselves. And so like when you feel complete, I think inside yourself, you don't look to the outside world to complete it anymore, which, which helps you function at a higher conduct. It helps you not only like do that, but you live in more peace and more happiness. And I think the, the problem that everybody runs into, if especially from Western culture, or let's just say from that side, is that you, what you run into is when you stop functioning from a place of lack, then you go, well, why would I do anything? Because everything you've done has been driven by fulfilling lack. And once you acknowledge that you're not lacking anything in, in, in worth, then it's like, well, why would I do anything at all? And that's a great place to get to. That is the actual point of transformation. That's a great question to ask yourself. And just think about the silliness of it. Well, I better be in lack so that I do something. It's like, but maybe you, if you were fulfilled and maybe in peace and maybe happy and you felt worthy or worth something, you would do things from an entirely different place with a much more genuine, authentic approach. Yeah. And I think that, because that is, I, I've had conversations with with people before who who said like, "Oh my god!" Like somewhat uh, along the this topic, um, who said that you know, I was like, "Oh, I'm concerned that I would just like I would I would just I would stop doing things that I've been doing in my life and and da 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 da, da if that if that happened, and you know, it's like maybe you would, but maybe some of it you wouldn't. You know, like, and I think that sort of, you know, what came to mind is that, is that a question that a lot of times sort of in like sort of development or trying to figure, figure out like sort of what you want in your life. One of the most common questions that gets thrown out there is like, okay, well, if money was no object, right? If you had, or if you won, if you won the lottery, you know, you, you like made a hundred million dollars or something winning the lottery, what would you do? Right. And it's like, like, what would you, you do with your life? And lots of people was like, well, you know, I, I'd quit my job. Right. Cause they fucking hate their job. So I'm quitting my job. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're going to quit your job. How wonderful is that? Um, and then what would you do? It's like, well, you know, I go traveling for a while or, you know, I buy a new house. This and that. It's like, okay. Yeah. Great. Great then what, you know, like the thing is, is that in that context, when we think of it in that way, um, I think we allow ourselves to actually explore a little bit about what we would do with our lives because yeah, maybe you'd put your feet up for a little while, but eventually you're going to be like, I want to do something, mm -hmm. you know, I wanted, I, I want to do something in the world. I want to do something in my life. It is, but you've sent, it's in many ways, the same kind of thing, because all of a sudden it's just like you remove that sense of desire. Cause for so many of us that, that desire is 
very so often monetary right like is like having enough you know having a certain amount in the bank having you know a house and a car and it's all paid off and all that stuff you don't have to worry about any of that anymore like that's such a a thing that consumes so much of our of our mental energy not not just but our mental and our physical energy and suddenly it's like well what if that was gone that desire that has been pretty much all consuming is gone Now what do you do? And you, and if you really think about it, honestly, you realize that that's not, it doesn't mean you just stop, right? People don't just go, people don't lament winning the lottery because they're like, oh no, what am I going to do with my life now? (laughs) Right? People go like, oh my God, I can do anything with my life now. And maybe that, that requires some work. and, And certainly you hear stories of people who actually go through, um, pretty significant, um, challenges, you know, um, and depressions and things after, um, not necessarily winning the lottery, but, you know, after becoming financially successful through their careers or whatever it is, having this, this discovery, like, Oh shit, what am I doing? You know, cause it was all about this thing now and now I have it. And now what do I do? Yeah. What do I do with my life? Because this thing that I was doing, I did it for this. And now I don't really give about, give a shit about this thing that I'm doing. Right. And so it's like, so now what do you do? Is it, is it game over? No, it's not. Right. It's not game over. It's, it's, it's a deepening. Yeah. It's a, it's, 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 a, an op- and it's a, it's a new game too. You know, you're, you've actually transcended. Yeah. Yeah. You've, you've actually, tra- you've actually moved to a new level. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it's there's a there's a terrific classic um sort of book called Siddhartha. Uh, I I fail to remember the name of the author, Swiss author. But anyhow, it it's a fascinating story about a about a, you know, kind of like a parable about a about a person who attains enlightenment. Sem quasi sort of based a little bit on the story of the Buddha. Um but you know, there's a whole whole part of of that book where this this person heads out on sort of this quest of enlightenment from a young age and then at a certain point just decides essentially ah screw it i'm gonna i'm gonna become successful and make a shit ton of money and uh (laughs) live my life that way And, and he does you know like and and um it's it becomes part of the journey until you know it it and makes him more I'm getting off topic. Um, there's something else I wanted to talk about um, in but here. You, because, you had a point with that book, though. Um, yeah, well, I mean, essentially that it's that 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 whole dynamic of of getting sort of everything, having a whole sort of, you know, having every sort of material um, mm-hmm. advantage that you could that you could imagine having um and how essentially that that leads to that actually will lead to a deeper form of existence or at least it can you know like when you when you follow that all the way through because that that material existence all starts to start um showing up empty to a certain extent, you know, it's, it's, it, it shows its limits of what it can do for us as, as human beings. And, um, and it just sends, sends us on a quest of, okay, uh, so now what do I do that is meaningful? What can I, and very often like, what can I give? Mm -hmm. Right. Which is kind of the, Um, the philanthropic attitude very, very often for people who have a lot, because it's just like, well, what can I do? How can I actually put this to use? Because how many trips can I go on? How many cars can I have? How many houses can I have? I mean, you can have a lot, but I mean, how, how many is, is actually necessary. Right. Um, so that was kind of the point that I was trying to make. I want to quickly go back or maybe not so quickly, but we'll see. Um, in something that you said, because it really, it really struck me, um, in the moment that you, you didn't say this specifically, but it is what you were saying. Um, because you were talking 
about love and there's this i think that this conversation about self-worth and love are uh they they go together in this whole thing um and you brought in this word conditional and i think that that is maybe the strongest way that i could put what i was taking a very long time to say prior but your worth is unconditional mm-hmm. your worth is unconditional and i think that that is part of uh the challenge is because we are so conditioned to think that our worth is conditional like it is comp- like we live as if it is completely conditional my worth as a human being is conditional upon this factor and this factor and this factor and this factor and you're constantly in this pursuit of having to get it because it's based on all of these conditions mm-hmm. and if i meet all these conditions i'll have worth but there's no condition that will give that to you yes and so the i think that the the lesson the task the quest um of that acceptance is the acceptance that your worth is unconditional yeah your 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 worth has comes with no no strings attached to it it is it just simply is what will you do with that what do you do with that you know like and i know even for me like I, and i hope that nobody is hearing me say this like oh yeah i've learned this one you know like i i get it i, I it's like a, believe me i've like this is this is a that's a a challenging one that is that is a tough one to 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 accept um to say that like because even in saying the words as much as i was struck by them um i'm also it's also like i can feel the resistance to letting them even land you know like really truly fully land that's like your worth is unconditional Mm -hmm. right it's just like i don't it's like i don't even know what that means to a certain extent, you know, it's like, I don't like, do I know what that means? Yeah, I know what it means, but do I really know what it means? Yeah. Not yet. (laughs) Not yet. But that's an, that's a, uh, an interesting thing to pursue. That's an interesting thing to seek out is that real, true, full understanding of those words because those words are i think are are a game changer if we allowed them to really work on us mhm yeah it's one it's one of those conversations where you know we're talking about very deep subject matter because it's so foundational and instrumental to like life itself and you know it's uh it's tough to be, it's tough to be in a world where like, you know, you're, um, you're basically like, you're, you're, you're struggling. You're, you're struggling to try to add up to it and try to try to get the rewards in it and, and, you know, and all of this other stuff. And, um, I, what I think, you know, what I think I'm kind of coming to is like, there's just simply a lot of confusion. You know, there's a lot of confusion going on and we we are we need to we, like it's like a raising consciousness. You know, it's like your consciousness is at a certain point and you're when you get to when you get to the point of accepting that you're that you're worth something regardless of what you do or what you become or whatever, that you're loved unconditionally. Um, it's, you know, there's a new place in which you're going to be acting from. And so that is a new f- form of consciousness because 
everything you're doing when you're trying to satisfy that is like, it's, it's like, really, it's like, if you, you know, you want to put it, it's like your lower self, right? It's trying to, um, it sees itself in terms of lack and incomplete and without and all of that. Right. And so it's trying to go out and get, and I, th I think like something that, you know, I mean, I, <laughs> I haven't fully figured it out yet, but like when I look at me behaving from my lower self, I'm almost like, oh, how silly, <laughs> like how ridiculous <laughs> that I'm going out trying to get something I already have, like how silly, but then, you know, I probably default every now and then back into, oh man, I just, I just want this. I just, this will make me feel better, you know, or whatever. Um, so I think that there's like a, <laughs> I, th I think that as, as we talk about this, I'm like looking at it and going, okay, maybe, maybe it begins with going like, okay, if I, if I wasn't feeling in lack, like if I didn't feel like I needed to go out and get these things, like if I had all the money, I needed all the, whatever I needed, everything I needed, right. What would I do then? And I think that most of us in the lower form of consciousness don't ask that question. All we're focused on is once I get this, then I'll be happy. But like, let's let's say you already had it. You're already there, right? It's it's that's done. There's no more worrying about that anymore. Now what? And I think that's that's really where this kind of boils down to me is like that's the question you need to be asking because that's the real question. Uh, everything else is all just kind of actually it's kind of bullshit because. Um, you're you're gonna find out, and I, I think like I think this is pretty much standard and common. And I think people are beginning to to grasp this on the most part. I think this is becoming more common knowledge. It's not such a rare idea anymore. But people are beginning to realize that once you have everything, that it's not what you thought it would be. And people have talked about this all the time. You know, Jim Carrey mentioned like, I hope you get everything you want so you can find out it's not what you want. You know, mm -hmm. and and there's many people who have shared that sentiment with us. And I think, you know, as our, as we've been evolving, we've been more and more open to going, yeah, like, that's probably true. But we're like, you're still, but I, but I still want it. <laughs> you know, I still want it. And it's like, you know, let me just get there. And then, then I'll just deal with it when I get there. But like, if you just cut out the middleman of this whole game you're playing, and you just get to the point, okay, let's say I have it now, what would I do? Um, you might find that that answers some very deep and profound questions, you know? And so I don't know, like for myself, like as I've gone through, you know, I've, I've gone through my journey with certain things, I kind of look at it like, I'm not going to try to control this anymore. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to like, it's, it's just silly to me. Like there's certain things that I was after when I was younger and it's like, I'm, well, I'm not going to go after that anymore because I don't need that anymore because all I was doing that for was to get something I thought I was lacking. And now I know I'm not lacking it. So why would I do it? And so I rely more now on, you know, I think how you put it, Evan was like calling. And I look at it more like calling. It's like, where do I feel called to go? As opposed to like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not, I'm not going to actively consciously decide I'm going to go do this because I need to complete this thing. It's more like, I'm just going to listen. And where do I feel pulled to? Where do I feel compelled to go to? Not because I need anything out there, but just because there's some magnetic force, some energy, something that makes me feel like this feels like the way I want to direct myself. And let's see what I find when I get there. And it's a much more peaceful, harmonious experience of doing my life. And I, and it feels much more on purpose. And although at times I'm like, I don't even know why I'm going over here. All I know is that I feel in my heart, I don't know how to explain that, this just seems like the right way to go. And so... I'll go this way. And then maybe at some point along the way, I'll, 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 I'll come to a new awareness, a new enlightenment. I'll see something else. And then if the path redirects or changes a little bit, I will honor that calling. And so it's more like I'm being like the, like the life that I 
am truly meant to live is already looking for me. It's like, I don't need to, I don't even need to know what it is. I just need to listen and feel it and connect with it and go towards it. And if I do that, good things come of it. That's kind of my, that's kind of my thought. And, and self-worth is like, it's already in me. So all I have to do is just listen to what's in me and it will tell me where I need to go. And I think that some people, they maybe look at that and they go, well, that's so passive. It's really not passive because I get quite active about activating my calling, but I'm just not the one saying like, I need this to complete this, to feel good. Like mm -hmm. I can already feel good on my way to my calling. I'm not getting to my calling to feel good. I already feel good. But once you already feel good and then you, you know, like for me, like I got to a point where it was, well, why do anything at all? What's the point of doing anything? And then that becomes a very interesting question to start to answer, which I, I'll, I'll admittedly say I have not got the answer for you, but working out the answer is part of what makes it so fascinating. I put it that way. Yeah. But um, Evan, I think yeah. we should, I think we should get to the point where we wrap this baby up. I, just... I agree. I okay. agree. I'm feeling that same, like we've hit the, we've hit the witching hour okay. of this one. So, um, well, do you have a beer? yeah, I do. I do have a beer. I'm drinking, um, a fantastic little beer. I, probably we've had this one before. Um, I'm drinking the Dusk Pale Ale from the Parkside Brewery in uh, Port Moody, British oh. Columbia. Um, lots of great breweries there in Port Moody doing some fantastic stuff. And uh, yeah, it's good, man. It's pale ale. It's got, uh, you know, easy to drink, but with a little bit of something for the taste buds to grab onto and ease drinking works works for me <laughs> nice man well that's great i uh i have this one today it's a hazy pale ale which i always love those mm. this one's called teardrop and it's from silver valley brewing co and i don't know if i've had this one or not but i can tell you that it's delicious <laughs> Just absolutely delicious. And they have a bunch of the Silver Valley Brewing Co. Like I looked at their selection that they had and I was like, I want that. I want that. I want <laughs> everything they had. I was like, oh my God, it's so hard to just make a choice. So I went with this one, the teardrop. I'm not, if I've had it before, I mean, I'm sure I liked it before because it's just a really good tasty beer. Um, yeah, man. Awesome. I love a hazy pale ale. I just, they're so good. So anyway, that's what I've been, that's what I've been sipping. Um, nice. you got it. You got any closing thoughts? Um, I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll just reiterate for me, which is, you know, something that, that will probably go up on, uh, on my, uh, my chalkboard <laughs> here, which is, uh, again, um, your worth is unconditional. Um, because I really want to sit with that one. You know, I really want to sit with, with that message. Um, because I believe it's true. Um, but it's not something that, uh, is, is so easily just taken on. Um, there's a lot of, of layers in between, <laughs> in between that and me it feels like so um but you know in some ways you i i think i would i would maybe share something like but act act as if your worth is unconditional mm. um maybe you don't believe it yet maybe i don't believe it yet i know i don't believe it I don't believe it yet, but act as if it, act as if it's true, you know, a little bit of fake it until you make it. What, what would that change? What would that, that change if your worth was unconditional? If it wasn't based on anything. There was nothing to prove, nothing you had to be, no, no image you had to hold up. 
None of it. All of that was just gone. What 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 would you do? What will you do now? Mm-hmm. You know, try it on just as a thought experiment. Really try it on. Really think about it. Really consider it. You know, go for a walk with it or sit down quietly with it, undisturbed, and really consider it. What would you do? I think that there's there's tremendous value to be found just in that on our way to that full acceptance of it and maybe through living our lives a little bit more and and having our our decisions and our actions just permeated with a little bit of of that you know just marinating a little bit in this idea of of your worth being unconditional you know that that might be just enough to set something in motion on the way to really believing that within mm. ourselves. So, um, yeah, man, your worth is unconditional. Well, that's, that's nice. I mean, I, like, I love a lot of what you said and, uh, I think, um, oh man, well, I, I think it's like where you're, where you're acting from is kind of what I'm thinking about as I walk away from this is like, where am I acting from? Where's, where are people acting from? And as you're going through your journey, like, you know, if you're trying to improve yourself for the sake of improving yourself, I think it's a big red flag that you're, you're not trusting your worth. Like you're, 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 you're trying to, you know, so I would check in with that. If you're in the self-improvement path, for the sake of self-improvement, I think, I think you want to stop and I think you want to reevaluate what you're doing there. What I think is that you, you want to find a worthy, a worthy goal, a worthy, a worthy journey to go on. Something that, that compels you, that interests you to go on, not because you need to do it because people will like it or you'll get something out of it or just something that you feel you'd like to do, that you feel called towards, that you feel magnetized towards, you know, whatever that might be. And what you will find is if if you do this, and this, this I do feel I can speak on, if you find a worthy goal, the problems that you face, the challenges you face will tell you everything you need to know about how you need to improve. And you will answer those problems if you stay committed and persistent with it you will improve inevitably because you'll be answering the challenges you face and you'll be trying to work it out and trying to figure it out. And you'll talk to the right people and you'll, you'll ask the right questions and you'll look for help. And the worthy goal, it, it does make you improve and you wind up becoming someone or something that can, can do some pretty incredible things because you set out to do whatever task you're doing but you'd never needed to become better for the sake of becoming better. It's just to answer the goal or the calling, the, the, the path that you wanted to direct yourself down. And I think wh whatever you're doing, like wherever you're, you know, directing yourself is if, you know, maybe you're like, well, I still, I want to do this thing that I'm doing. Just my, my suggestion and, this is just what I, I I'm kind of finishing with here is just direct it from a different place. Like if you're doing it because you're like, Oh, if I do this, then everybody will love me and I'll be appreciated and I'll get these things and I'll get, and I'll get, and I'll get, if you're doing it from that place, I think it's worthwhile to revisit it and go, well, let's say I had all those things I'm trying to get. Would I still do this? And if you still would, why would you do it and do it for that reason? Because that is a much, that's a much more true, true reason. Because the reality is, is I think what Evan and I are trying to, to, to get to here is that you're not lacking in the way that you might be functioning in your life this way. Like you're not actually lacking that way. And so it's not that you will necessarily change what you're doing, but in some ways, the, when you function from lack, 
you actually, in some ways, I think also keep that thing away from you. Like it becomes, you can't actually ever have what you want because it is an endless pit. It will never be satisfied. And what a lot of people do find out, and I know this from personal experience through, you know, a, a, a lot of people that I've worked with and mentors I've had and whatever, the, the, the sentiment is the same. I got what I wanted and it didn't solve the problem because they thought, well, if I got the money, I got the success, I got the thing. And it just didn't give them what they thought they wanted. And then they have the awakening. So I think, you know, you can, you can shortcut that you can kind of, you know, you can cut out all the, the nonsense around having to go get there to find out. You can find that out right now on the journey. And then you will, will just save yourself a lot of time and energy and angst really, I think, because a lot of that stuff is just, you know, it's like, like putting all your good value into a pit that will never give you anything back. It really just won't. So start putting your value you know, into something that is actually building. And one last thing I'll say on this, and I mean, look, everybody's at their own stage and they'll take this however they will. But instead of looking what you're trying to get, try to look at what you're trying to give. Because at the end of the day, when you realize that you have everything that you need, all that will matter is what you contribute. That That is all that will matter. And that's what's going to bring you true happiness and true joy is to see your value in the world through what you contribute, what you give. Um, and you have already a lot to give and you just don't recognize that you don't realize that yet. So, um, you know, you don't need to go get, you can start giving now and you're going to get way more than you would ever try to get from getting. It's, it's a, it's a funny thing, man. It's like almost backwards to us, but anyway, try that. That's my advice and, uh, you know, take it as you will. <laughs> Thank you for listening in on our conversation today. We hope you found something helpful that you can carry forward with you. Head over to our website, wayoftheartist.com, for more free exclusive material and learn about the show. If you haven't already, please support us by subscribing to the show, sharing it with people you know, and keeping compassionate, creative conversation going.